the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from John Russell and Alice Bryant. Later, we will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, here is John Russell. Taiwanese officials will lift a ban on pig meat imports from the United States. Taiwan's parliament gave the final approval to the move last week. Most American pigs are raised with the food additive ractopamine. An additive is something that is given or added to the food an animal eats. Ractopamine is used to cause leanness in the pig's meat, called pork. But the additive is banned by 160 countries, including China, Russia, and the European Union. The imports will begin Friday. They remove what Taiwanese officials believe to be an important barrier in U.S. trade ties. Freddie Lim is a Taiwanese lawmaker. He said recently, When I've made visits to the United States, the U.S. representatives would always bring up this topic, and now this issue that kept being brought up is out of the way. Lim said he felt optimistic, or good, given past experiences and reactions. Officials in Taiwan have tried since 1994 for a free trade deal with the United States. Lu Yi Chun is a public affairs professor at Fu Guang University in Taiwan. Lu recently said that Taiwan has to fully engage into active international trade with foreign countries. Taiwan Premier Su Sung Chang told Parliament in November that the United States was Taiwan's most powerful ally. He also explained that his government would require inspections at American meat factories and clear product labeling to protect food safety. Until now, Taiwan has avoided American pork because of the idea that ractopamine could be linked to human health problems. Government-operated Central News Agency reported in November that lifting the ban could help support efforts for a trade deal with the United States. Taiwan's President Tsai Ing-wen announced in August the possibility of letting in American pork. U.S. officials answered, saying Tsai's decision would open the door to greater economic and trade cooperation between the United States and Taiwan. The U.S. Trade Representative's office has not said Taiwan must permit pork imports to qualify for a trade deal, Minority Party lawmaker Charles Chen said. I think this matter raises major doubts among Taiwanese domestically about whether there will be any sort of exchange with the U.S. Trade Representative Office, Chen said. If not, then it doesn't mean that the Trade Representative will give us any advantages. Chen's opposition Nationalist Party notably opposed the deal. I'm John Russell. Scientists in Italy have uncovered a fast food eatery in the ancient Roman town of Pompeii. The remains help in the understanding of foods that were popular among Pompeii's citizens. 
Pompeii Archaeological Park's chief, Massimo Osana, said Saturday that about 80 such fast food eateries have been found at Pompeii. But the latest find is the first time that a hot food drink eatery, known as a thermopolium, was completely uncovered. Plant and animal specialists are still examining remains from the site. Some of the thermopolium's counter area was partly dug up in 2019 during work to repair Pompeii's ruins. Since then, archaeologists have kept digging. They uncovered a large counter area with wide holes on its top. The counter held deep containers for hot food. The front of the counter included works of art showing ducks and chickens. The images brightened the eatery and also likely served as food advertisements. Another painting shows a dog on a leash. Valeria Amoretti is an anthropologist at Pompeii. She said early studies confirm how the painted images represent, at least in part, the foods and beverages effectively sold inside. She noted that small pieces of duck bones were found in one of the food containers. Remains from goats, pigs, fish, and snails also were found. At the bottom of a wine container were remains of ground fava beans. In ancient times, the beans were added to wine for taste and to lighten its color, Amoretti said. Massimo Osana added, We know what they were eating that day. He was talking about the day of Pompey's destruction in 79 A.D. The food remains are examples of what's popular with the common folk, Osana told Italy's Rai State TV. He added that wealthy Romans did not eat at such street food businesses. One surprise find at the dig was the complete skeleton of a dog. The scientists involved in the dig noted it was not a large muscular dog like that painted on the counter. Instead, it was a very small adult dog, whose height at shoulder level was 20 to 25 centimeters, Amoretti said. She added it is rare to find remains from ancient times of such small dogs. The find may show that Romans at the time were carrying out selective breeding of dogs. The scientists also found a bronze serving device, nine food containers, a couple of drink containers, and a container for oil at the site. Successful restaurant owners know that a good location is important for business. The operator of this ancient fast-food eatery seemed to have found a good place for doing business. Osana noted that right outside the eatery was a small square with a fountain. Another thermopolium was nearby. Pompeii was destroyed by the volcanic eruption of Mount Vesuvius, which is near present-day Naples. Much of the ancient city still lies uncovered. The site is one of Italy's most popular areas for visitors. The new year can come on different dates for different cultures. Most of the Western world, for example, celebrates it on January 1st. But one thing many cultures have in common is the idea of New Year's resolutions. A New Year's resolution is a personal goal to change unwanted behavior, make a life improvement, or try something new. 
popular New Year's resolutions in the United States, for example, include losing weight, improving your finances, volunteering for a charity, and spending less time on social media. On today's Everyday Grammar, we will show you how to talk about resolutions in English. First, let's learn how to ask people about their resolutions. Listen to a short conversation. Hey there, Jill. Happy New Year. Great to see you. Hi, Jonathan. Happy New Year to you, too. How was yours? It was crazy. We went to New York and watched the ball drop in Times Square. Really crowded and loud, but still really fun. Sweet. Do you have any New Year's resolutions? Jill asked Jonathan about resolutions simply by saying, do you have any New Year's resolutions? You can also say, what are your New Year's resolutions, to ask about more than one, or what is your New Year's resolution, to ask about one. Now, let's find out how to answer the question. When we make statements about our resolutions, we often use phrasal verbs. We can use the phrasal verb take up to say that we will start a new activity as a hobby. Listen to Jill and Jonathan continue their conversation. Sweet. Do you have any New Year's resolutions? Yes, I do. I plan to take up kickboxing starting next week. I'm excited to finally do it rather than just talk about it. How about you? Another phrasal verb for resolutions is give up which is to stop doing or using something. We can use this verb to talk about ending bad habits or changing a behavior for a time. Let's hear Jill respond by using the verb give up. How about you? I'm giving up sugar for the month of January. Then for the rest of the year, I'm avoiding soft drinks. Impressive. I wish I could join you, but kickboxing class starts soon. I'll probably want a sweet snack after class. Another phrasal verb, cut out, has the same basic meaning as give up. For example, Jill could say, I am cutting out sugar for the month of January. But in many situations, we do not need phrasal verbs to talk about resolutions as you will soon see. Next, let's talk about verb tenses and forms. Jonathan talked about his new kickboxing hobby using the verb plan followed by the infinitive verb form, and Jill talked about giving up sugar using the present continuous verb tense, also called B plus ING. We can also use the simple future tenses, one with will and the other with going to. These tenses are especially useful when the new year has not come yet. Imagine it's the last week of the year, and a few people are talking to each other about resolutions. Here are some things you might hear. In 2020... I'm going to visit my parents every month. By January 1st, I will end a few unhealthy friendships. In the new year, I'm going to walk 10,000 steps every day. When we use simple future tenses to talk about resolutions, we're expressing that we are making a promise to or plan for ourselves. The noun resolution comes from the verb resolve, which means to make a serious decision to do something. You may have noticed that the statements so far today did not actually use the word resolution. That is because the subject was already known by the listeners. But it is still perfectly normal to start your statements with my New Year's resolution is, or my New Year's resolutions are. An infinitive verb or a gerund must come after these phrases. 
Here is an example. My New Year's resolution is to call my sister on video chat every week. The infinitive verb here is to call. You can also use a gerund like this. My New Year's resolution is calling my sister on video chat every week. Well, that's all for today's program. Tell us about your New Year's resolutions in the comments below. Happy New Year! I'm Alice Bryant. Welcome to The Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. The war between the United States and Spain in 1898 was one of the shortest in American history. The fighting lasted about three months. Yet that short war led to long-term changes for America. Victory made the United States an increasingly important world power. Larry West and Shep O'Neill tell about those developments. The United States received several of Spain's island colonies as part of the peace agreement. The most important was the Philippines. Many Americans thought the United States should not have overseas territories. But President William McKinley thought the Philippines were unprepared for independence. He decided to keep the islands and prepare the people for self-government in the future. A Filipino nationalist group led by Emilio Aguinaldo rejected American control. Aguinaldo declared the formation of a Philippine Republic, and he started a guerrilla war against the occupying forces. The rebellion in the Philippines became a major issue in America's presidential election of 1900. The Republican Party renominated William McKinley as president, and it nominated a hero of the Spanish-American War, New York Governor Theodore Roosevelt, as vice president. The Democratic Party, for the second time, nominated Congressman William Jennings Bryan as president. It nominated a former vice president, Adlai Stevenson, as vice president again. William Jennings Bryan campaigned against the American takeover of the Philippines. He received support from a new group, the Anti-Imperialist League. Members included leading American politicians, businessmen, and writers. President McKinley did not campaign much. He let vice presidential candidate Theodore Roosevelt do it. Roosevelt spoke of America's success as a new economic and political power in the world. He said the Republican Party was responsible. The majority of voters liked what Roosevelt said. They elected the Republican candidates. The Republican victory destroyed the hopes of many nationalists in the Philippines. With William McKinley in the White House again, they saw little chance of gaining independence. Nationalist leader Emilio Aguinaldo, however, refused to surrender. As long as he remained free, the guerrilla war would continue. For months, American forces tried without success to find him. Finally, with the help of a tribe of Filipino mercenary soldiers, called the Macabebe Scouts, they captured him. Aguinaldo signed an agreement to support the United States. With this agreement, the rebellion ended on the island of Luzon, 
but it continued for more than a year in the southern Philippines. Hostilities ended officially on July 4th, 1902. American occupation of the Philippines made the United States a major power in the Far East. As such, it began to develop new policies toward Asia, especially a new policy toward China. Americans had been trading with China for years, but not heavily. As the American economy grew, however, businessmen saw China with a population of 400 million people, as a great market for American products. Other countries were interested in this market, too. Britain, France, Germany, Japan, and Russia all claimed special rights in parts of China. They began to divide the country into areas called spheres of influence, it seemed these areas could become foreign colonies. Then the United States would be cut off from trading directly with China. To prevent that from happening, American Secretary of State John Hay proposed what became known as the Open Door Policy. Secretary Hay asked the nations involved to agree to equal trading rights for all countries in all parts of China. No nation, he said, should interfere with the rights or powers of any other nation in China. No one welcomed the proposal, but no one rejected it either. Most of the nations involved said they agreed with the idea but they said they could not approve it unless everyone else did. Secretary Hay refused to wait for them to act. So in May 1900, he announced that all the nations involved had given their approval to the open-door policy. The new policy was tested very soon. Within a month of Hayes' announcement, violence broke out against foreigners in China. The attacks were led by a secret group called Righteous Harmonious Fists. Foreigners called its members Boxers. Boxers hated all foreign influence in China. They organized in areas where foreign influence was strongest. They killed Christian missionaries and Chinese who had accepted the Christian religion. They also destroyed foreign industries, especially railroads. The Chinese government in Beijing supported the Boxer Rebellion. It permitted the Boxers to occupy the capital. The rebellion lasted about two months. It ended when an allied force of American, British, French, German, and Japanese soldiers reached Beijing and ended the Boxer occupation. The foreign powers began to negotiate with China on paying for damages. The United States was worried about the results. It believed some of the nations involved would use the Boxer Rebellion as a way to gain more control over Chinese territory. Secretary of State Hay quickly announced America's policy on the issue. The United States, he said, wanted a settlement which would bring peace and safety to China. The settlement must protect China's territorial rights so it would not be divided into foreign colonies. Britain and Germany agreed. With their help, Secretary Hay got the others to accept money, not territory, as payment for damages. 
The final settlement forced China to pay $333 million. The United States used some of its share to pay for the education of Chinese students in America. The results of the Boxer Rebellion and the Spanish-American War made clear that the new century would have a new world power, the United States. And this new power had a president with the political skills to do the job, William McKinley. In September 1901, President McKinley made a major foreign policy speech at the Pan American Fair in Buffalo, New York. He spoke about the importance and the promise of America's new position in the world. The next day, President McKinley went to the fair's Temple of Music. He planned to spend several hours meeting the public and shaking hands. A young man waited in line to see him. When the young man stepped in front of McKinley... McKinley reached out to shake his hand. Two shots rang out from a gun the man had hidden under a cloth. One of the bullets struck McKinley in the stomach. The president was taken to an emergency hospital on the fairgrounds. He was not conscious. The bullet had damaged his stomach, pancreas, and one kidney, but doctors did not believe he was in danger of dying. The man who shot McKinley was Leon Cholgosh. Cholgosh was an anarchist. He believed all rulers were enemies of the people. He believed the people had the right to kill them. Cholgosh also was mentally ill. He had tried to join several anarchist groups. They refused to accept him, however, because of his mental condition. After shooting President McKinley, Cholgosh explained why he had done it. He said it was not right for one man to receive so much public honor, while he received none. For two days, the president remained in a coma. Then his condition changed. He regained consciousness and was able to talk. He rested and became stronger. Then the president's condition changed again. An infection developed in his wound. It spread throughout his body. In another few days, he was dead. Vice President Roosevelt hurried to Buffalo. He went to the house where the president's body lay. Then he went to another house to be sworn in as president. He was 42 years old, the youngest man ever to hold the office. Roosevelt declared that the administration would go on as before. It is my aim, he said, to continue unbroken the policy of President McKinley for the peace, the prosperity, and the honor of our beloved country. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.